Hello, friends. <laughs> Please join me once more in welcoming Justice Breyer back to the National Constitution Center. Thank you. It is always an honor to welcome our honorary co-chair here to the NCC, and it's extraordinarily meaningful to convene this evening to discuss his new book, Reading the Constitution, Why I Chose Pragmatism, Not Textualism. Justice, it is clear from this powerful book, which better than any other sums up the central methodological debate on the Supreme Court today between pragmatism, of which you are the leading spokesperson, and textualism, which is embraced by a Supreme Court majority. So I'm going to begin with the obvious question. Why did you choose to write this book about why you chose pragmatism, not textualism? It's a good question, because <laughs> uh, what uh, uh, many people say is the, the, the way I, I've been a judge for 40 years, 28 on the Supreme Court, and I want to get across, particularly to students and others, how do you go about deciding, or how do I have gone about deciding these difficult questions? And uh, difficult statutory questions, constitutional questions. And uh, there is a division of opinion. And this thing has come along out of the creature from the Black Lagoon. I mean, it's called textualism or originalism. And I don't think that's the appropriate way to go about it. And I think it'll cause a lot of trouble. And so I wrote, I want to write why. Not why from a scholar's point of view. You know, there are lots of scholars and teachers who will be able to do this better than I could do it. But I will say, and I say it a bit meanly, but I say I've had some experience to the scholars that you haven't had. And so I would like to write about it from the perspective of the cases and experience that I've had. And then you'll see why. I go this way. And maybe somebody else goes that way. But you can make up your own mind. So that's at least one reason why I wrote it. And there are others. I want <laughs> How many would you like? <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there. You just used the yeah. phrase, it came about like a creature from the Black Lagoon. Well, that was a bit, I, I hesitated <laughs> about that. Because, because I think the people who hold this point of view are sincere. And I think they have uh, honest uh, perspectives on it. And I think, and that's another reason. If I talk to an audience or non-lawyers, I know that 40% are going to say, why is he bothering writing this? It's all politics. And if they don't think it's all politics, uh, it's just the judges doing what they think is good or what they'd like to do. And I said, that's not been my experience. My experience over 40 years is, you can't say zero in politics, but no. That's not the main thing. The people who try to get the judge appointed, they may think that they have political views and these judge will carry them out in his opinion. But that isn't what the judge thinks when he's deciding a case. What the judge is thinking is this is the right approach, this is the right result, according to an approach that I believe is the proper way to interpret statutes like this or this Constitution of the United States. So they think they're doing it according to law, and what others think, that's not going to affect them as much, in my opinion, as if I sit down, oh, have you tried writing a book? Ugh. All right. But if you sit down and I try to put on paper what I think I've learned over 40 years about how you go about interpreting these statutes and these phrases in the Constitution. You want an example? That would be great. No, I'll give you an example first. What's the job? What's the job? The best thing I read on what's the job of an appellate court judge was in a French newspaper. I already discussed that with some of you. I read a French newspaper. It said, and this is when I'm talking to a bunch of high school students or fifth graders, even better with fifth graders. I say, in that article, it said a high school biology teacher was traveling from Nantes to Paris on the train. And he had next to him a basket. And in the basket 
there were 20 live snails. What's that, said the conductor. Have you bought a ticket for the snails? He says, what? <laughs> Have I bought a ticket for the snails? Are you crazy? He says, no, read the book. Read the fair book. The fair book says no animals on the train unless they have a half price ticket. He said, but they're talking about dogs, cats, rabbits, but surely not snails. You think they're talking about mosquitoes? Is a snail an animal or not? So I say to the fifth grade, what do you think? Perfect. I don't have to say another word. They get into the biggest argument you've ever seen. <laughs> Half of them say, of course, it's an animal. Well, well, what about a mosquito? Why did they, oh, yes, yes. And so I can just leave, and they're happy for the rest of the day. <laughs> and it's perfect. Now, I say, we're not talking about snails. I don't know of a statute that says snails. Maybe, could be, but the freedom of speech, the right to bear arms, a... Um, any other police officer, that's a law enforcement officer, it said in a statute. Now, you see, different words, same idea, same idea. Judge, what do those words mean? How do they apply? And once you see that, you say, ah, oh, ah, oh, how am I going to decide this one? How am I going to figure it out? Because if this is a case in the Supreme Court of the United States, we only take cases almost only take cases where different perfectly good judges in lower courts have come to different conclusions about the meaning or the application of the word, I want to say snails, but that isn't the word. <laughs> the word is usually the freedom of speech or something in a statute or some other word in the, uh, in the law. So it's tough, and now you have to figure out how to do it. And different people have done it different ways, and uh, what I say, of course, is I've written these several hundred pages, which you've done, too, in a very good book. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And uh, yeah. Pursuit of Happiness, it's called. Get it. <laughs> all right, all right. That was last word. Last okay, okay. okay. In, any, <laughs> in any case, in any case, uh, how do we go about it? Uh, Nino and I, Nino Scalia, who was a good friend, we used to argue about it. We'd argue publicly. We were in Lubbock, Texas, in a big stadium, because they'd never seen a Supreme Court justice before, and they thought maybe it'll be like a football game. <laughs> but in any case, there they were. And, and, and we, 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 they would come away from that discussion thinking, one, those two are good friends, which we were, which we were. And then I'm trying to figure out, look, how, what can I say here? Uh, that will make Nino see that life changes over time. And those words in the Constitution that stood for so clearly X 200 years ago, they have to adapt a little bit in their application, not necessarily in the values they have. So I said, you know, Nino, George Washington didn't, didn't know about the internet. He said, I knew that. <laughs> then he says, well, the problem is really the two campers. That's that. He says there are two campers, and one sees the other putting on his running shoes. And he says, well, what, what? He says, well there's a bear in the camp. The bear in the camp? You can't outrun a bear. He says, yeah, but I can outrun you. <laughs> All right. That's at one level of slight bad comedy. But at the other level, he says to me that you have a method using what's the purpose of this statue? What are the consequences of this way or that way? What are the values that it uh, embodies, and how does that relate to the values that are in this document, et cetera? It's possible, but complicated. And you're the only one who could do it. He's trying to compliment. <laughs> but he really thinks nobody could do it. <laughs> and then I say to him, hmm. and if we follow your approach, just looking at the words, just seeing what they meant to a reasonable observer at the time they were written, if we follow that approach, we're going to have a constitution that no one will want. 
And in my own mind, that's the real argument, those two ideas. And uh, if you say, well, you don't want judges going out there to substituting what they think is good for what is the law, I agree with that, and so does he. So what the real argument is beneath that is do you really think Nino Scalia, and there are two or three, he's one who really holds a tough view of textualism, which means you read that text and uh, you say what would it mean to a reasonable observer when it was written? You know, they, they, think, they think they'll be able to uh, better keep the judges under control. They promise you two things. One, when you just read the text and follow it, you will have a simpler system. You will have a system that people can follow. You will have a system that Congress can follow. You will treat people in different courts alike. Simple, clear, and more than that, as I've said three times already, you will have a system that keeps the judges in check, that stops them from substituting what they think is good for what the law is. Now, what do I say to that? I say, I think those promises are great. And I also think you can't possibly keep them, and you won't. That's what I would take as an answer, all right, as one of the answers. Now, am I right? I don't know how long you want me to go on. I wrote 280. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got lots of questions yeah, yeah. for you. All right. uh, um, you just laid out very clearly the difference between uh, pragmatism, which focuses on consequences and purposes and workability, and textualism, which asks what was the meaning of the text at the moment of its adoption. And you said it's not all politics. But I got the strong sense from this book that you do feel that there, it is about political philosophy, uh, and it's you trade, yeah. it's not politics, but what would you say to this uh, uh, takeaway from the book, which is what I got? that uh, presidents since the days of John Marshall have appointed justices to, mi to, to mirror their political philosophy, that Marshall favored a broad national government, and the counter was the Jeffersonians who wanted strict construction in order to protect states' rights and rein in federal power, and the current textualists are appointed for just the same reason, and they're trying to rein in federal power with their textualism. Maybe. I, that's at a level of generality that's so high that it's hard to have an answer. Of course, lots of presidents have been appointing X. And lo and behold, X turns out to decide cases differently than the president thought. Let's call X David Souter. <laughs> no. <laughs> but regardless. <laughs> but, Is but, he on X? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, no, but there, 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 there are many, many judges like that. Because when you're there, the first few years, you go around, oh my God, how did I get here? You don't tell anyone you thought that because you have to pretend you believe you're totally qualified. But, but uh, 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 yeah, can I do this job? Yeah, I sure hope so. And then after two years, three years, Souter thought three. William O. Douglas, I think, thought five. You say, well, I don't know, but I can do the best I can. And that's what you try to do, the best you can. And that's true of all of them. And of course, there may be different outlooks. And I think this outlook, uh, textualism, originalism, is not one of the most desirable. Let's try it. You want to try it? OK. We have a case. This is the case. You want to, are you ready for a textualist approach? Yes? OK. This is the case. It, it, there is a statute that says if you have a child, and that child is handicapped, the public school system has to give him an appropriate education, i.e. a good education. And if you think they're not doing that, you can bring a lawsuit. And the plaintiff in that case did, and she won. She won, and they had to change it. Well, very neat. You see, we have most of the cases we have are pretty technical, a lot of them, and they're pretty far down, and they don't get into the newspaper, but that's the majority. All right. Down it says in the text somewhere, it says, if she wins, you know what she gets? Costs. And she says to the judge, judge, one of the things that I had as a cost was a $29,000 bill from the educational expert. 
Does she get that from the school board? Is that part of the cost? Or do they just mean legal costs? And is that a legal cost? Well, I'll tell you how we're going to answer that. Let's read the word. Guess what the word was? Cost. <laughs> OK. We didn't read it hard enough. Let's say it twice. Cost, cost. Ah, now we've got the answer. Oh, no, three times. Cost, cost, cost. OK. Ah, you see? I say, where are we in this? We're in mixed up at best. And uh, that's not going to tell you the answer to that. Or did you know, you may not know, I shouldn't tell you this, but there are a lot of federal officers you can bring lawsuits against and maybe even recover some money. Don't tell anyone I said that. But, <laughs> but it's possible. It's possible. And then there's some exceptions. You can't sue these people who have this job. Which people? One of the exceptions says that you cannot sue for keeping property. It was uh, an officer of customs and excise or any other law enforcement officer. Ah, who do they mean by that last phrase? The cop on the beat? A German police officer? No, they don't mean that. But a cop on the beat? or those associated with customs and excise. So I say, oh, say it three times. Any other law enforcement officer, any other, oh, OK, I won't do it. But, but you, see, you see the problem? You see the problem? Or let's go into the realm that the press will actually write about. Let's go into the realm of guns. That's one where I wrote a long dissent with Justice Kagan and, and, and Justice Sotomayor. New York has a law which says you cannot carry a gun outside your house, concealed or not concealed? Does that violate the Second Amendment, which says a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed? I don't expect you to memorize all that in that. But, but you see, in an earlier case, over our descents of three of us, four of us then, um, he said, that has to do with militia. It doesn't have to do with holding a gun under your pillow to shoot a burglar. Five said it did. Four said it didn't. I think that was the number. So we passed that. Now we're at, I can't, I, can't, I mean, I lost that. OK, so now what about New York's law? And the court says, in the opinion, go look back at history and just history. Look at what, when this was passed, a reasonable person would have thought it meant. I said, oh, OK, that sounds good. What do I look at? So I started looking at a few of the old gun or weapons. Or, or oh, what, what about a Haldebard? Does that count? A skill ladder? And then there was Asian fire, which you took and threw over the walls, hoping to burn up somebody in. Was that the uh, origin of artillery? Not me. You see, I'm not very good at history, or at least not skill bar or skill ladders or whatever they are. And to ask the judges to decide on that way is not a good idea, in my opinion, because they don't know. They're not historians. And you'll get briefs. The briefs will go in opposite directions, and the historians will disagree. And then you have to decide about what a skill ladder was or whether it's a relevant. No. And what I wanted to write about, and I did. I wrote about it, yeah, in dissent. I said, I'd like it to be relevant here that the United States of America has 400 million guns. We are number one. Number one. Number two is Yemen, I think. OK? And look at the number of deaths and the policemen who are killed and the, and the uh, um, home accidents and the uh, uh, spousal problems, and my God, it is endless, endless. And I say, in my opinion, that kind of thing is relevant. I'm not saying you're just going to look at that. Of course we'll look at the words. If the word in a statute or the word in the Constitution, it's not in the Constitution, but suppose it was carrot. If it's carrot, that doesn't mean a fish. I got that point. But I want to go beyond that, and I want to say, when you can't get a clear answer from the statute, which is most of the time. Don't try to say the word costs 14 times. 
Don't try to say any other police officer, any other law enforcement officer, 18 times. Look for things people have looked to. Who are the people? Holmes, Brandeis, a Learned Hand, Thomas, uh, 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 Chief Justice Marshall, and many others. Look at the purpose. Someone wrote those words. Somebody had an idea when the words were written of what you were trying to do in Congress. Look at them. And when you're reading that Constitution, remember, among other things, it has certain values here. Democratic society, basic human rights, degree of equality. We separation of powers, rule of law. That's enough for the moment. <laughs> but they're there. And uh, take those into account, too. And remember, who said this? I don't want Montaigne, actually, 1584. You like these old writers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, 1584. He said, the worst mistake Justinian ever made. I read that, I thought, Justinian? Okay, but in any case, he said, the worst mistake these Roman emperors made is they wanted their legislators to write everything down in a statute. And we will have uh, statutes and statutes and statutes and words and words and words, and now my judges won't be able to do the things that they really want to do, but I don't want them to do it in the law. And Montaigne says, that man must have been an idiot. He didn't say quite like that, he was polite. But he said, didn't he realize that for lawyers, every extra word is just a basis for disagreement. And instead of his discovering that more people will agree, he might discover fewer judges will disagree, will agree or disagree with him. He will agree with him. They won't. You don't know. Because life changes. And life has far more to it than a simple static process. And when these words are written, they have to be written in a way, as Chief Justice Marshall says, that they will have to apply, and they will have to help us adjudicate. They will have to help us live with a world that is changing. And that's why the freedom of speech, however clear what it applied to in 1789, is not going to be clear how it applies to whatever they call it, AI or you know, <laughs> those different things. And so you better think, judge. You better look not just at the words in the many cases where those words just don't answer. You better look at a few other things, purposes, consequences, values, and perhaps others as well. Will that let me just do anything I want? I never think I do everything I want. You try living with my children and grandchildren and you'll understand. <laughs> okay, but uh, no, no. You try as a judge to do your best to follow the law. And so what I'm doing here is saying, assume with me that that's correct. And I think people should because I've, I've, I do have experience in that. And now what do we do? And now what do we do about this tidal wave of textualism or originalism? that seems to be coming along and replacing in the schools, replacing in the law schools, replacing in a lot of places the tendency to ask, once you've read it, okay, what's the purpose? What was the mischief that Congress was trying to stop? What was the objective? Will this consequence fit within and help achieve that objective? or the opposite, you see? And that's, that's basically what I'm doing. What, telling people? No, I'm trying to show them here. I'm trying to show them with examples, with enough examples that they'll be able, by they get time, if they get to the end of this book, they'll be able to say, he's asking me, which I am, to make up my own mind. Of course, I hope you'll make it up in my direction. <laughs> but nonetheless, nonetheless, it's something that people have to learn about and um, think about and decide about for themselves. And in my own view, I think we'll get a lot farther with uh, the Supreme Court doing sort of what I think it ought to do uh, than we will just by saying, oh, it's all politics, oh, it's all politics. I, that doesn't help me very much. 
Well, you do do it with examples, and the gun case is a perfect example of your defense of pragmatism and your critique of originalism. For your defense of pragmatism, you say, this is what judges have almost always done. And it goes back to Marshall, and it was Holmes, and it was Frankfurter, and this is ordinarily the way the Supreme Court approaches cases. And it leads to more workable results. And for the critique, you say, this w was bad history, the scholars did a word search and they found that that's not what it meant in uh, 1789. And you say that it's moving the baseline and that uh, it doesn't constrain judges, which was the main promise of originalism. And you also say that it uh, leads to uh, a failure to defer to democratic outcomes, which is the other thing that was supposed to happen with originalism and is not happening. So that's all encapsulated in your defense of the gun case. And now I want you to talk about Dobbs and abortion, which is another of your major examples. Yeah, but I'm only going to talk about a little bit of that. I did dissent in that case, and uh, we wrote, uh, Justices Kagan and Sotomayor wrote a pretty long dissent, and we had a lot of different reasons why we thought the majority was wrong in that case. And one of the reasons I think is directly relevant to, to what I'm writing in this book. Remember the two promises that the textualists made? This is going to be a simple, clear method to which I give a wonderful response. I say, ha, 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 okay. Now, that isn't a very good response, but nonetheless. All right, uh, I try to explain. But remember the second promise. The second promise was we have a system that will make it much more difficult for a judge to substitute what he thinks is good for what the law requires. Now, I say, you know, they try not to do that. Nobody can do it perfectly. I did grow up in San Francisco. I went to Lowell High School. I've lived the life I've lived. And uh, um, yeah, we all have. And by the time we're in our 40s or 50s, we have sort of views about our profession and about the country and about our neighbors, about all kinds of things. And to try to hold any job and keep all that stuff totally out, you can't. You can't jump out of your own clothes. But you can try to limit it. And I think judges, too, they try to limit it. So don't take what I'm saying as 100%, but it's there. What the judge is trying to do is be honest about the decision, decide it the way you just said. But what about the textualism? Will that hold us in check when we slip back to the San Francisco School Board? That's my father's watch. It says San Francisco School Board. <laughs> but uh, will it? And I found Dobbs interesting there, because to my imaginary textualist opponent on that, I would say, um, hmm, why did you overrule Roe 50 years ago, decided? Why did you overrule uh, Casey v. Polino 30 years ago? I mean, isn't there a principle in the law called stare decisis? You see, he knows this Latin, so I have to be careful. <laughs> I don't. A star, stare decisis. <laughs> Uh, which means something's decided, it's decided, and don't change it, even if it's wrong. Now, that's not 100%. The court did change Plessy v. Ferguson, went to Brown versus Board. I'm glad they did. It's not 100%, but you better limit it. So I would like to know, Mr. Textualist, what are you going to overrule next? Hmm. Are you going to overrule, or are they candidates for overruling any case that wasn't decided by a textualist method? Well, if that's your view, every case is up for grabs, because there are hardly any textualist cases before quite recently. So we're going to have no law at all, every case, what do you think the clients will love it? They'll go into the lawyer's office and say, you tell me I'm going to lose, but let's tell them overrule it. This is going to be a mess. Oh, you don't mean that. And he doesn't. And they don't. What do you mean? Well, I think you mean the cases that not only weren't decided according to a textualist method, which is about all of them, nearly all, and you think, and you think they were very wrong. Ah, you think they were very wrong. And so we bring that in as a ground for overruling. Now, let's step back to page one for a second. 
because you and Nino and the others criticize me on the ground, which I try not to do, that you just pick the cases that you think are good. Uh -huh. And now what you're going to do is get rid of the cases you think are really wrong. Does that give you an opportunity to choose what you think is good when you decide what you're going to overrule? I mean, you think they're wrong. On what basis? On the basis of textualism? No, on some other basis. What basis? I mean, what is it? I mean, there you are, in the same boat precisely that you say I'm in. And so you better have the conscience of a good judge in deciding what to overrule, just as I must do the same, OK, in cases that aren't there for overruling. And so I don't see much to choose there at best. So now we have two promises, simple, clear, definite. Oh, that one went by the boards. Promise number two, a better way of holding judges in check. Mm. Well, there it is, by the boards, in Dobbs, in my opinion. And so now what we're left with? I say what we're left with, nothing. That's what I want to say. We're left with next to nothing. And more than that, I think there's something dangerous about this. Dangerous why? Well, you know, I hate to admit it, but Congress is closer to what the people of their constituencies need and want than the Supreme Court up on that hill there with a lot of nice rooms and uh, not very good food. I was in charge of getting the food ready for 11 years because I was a junior justice, and I admit it wasn't very good. <laughs> but uh, um, you see? Uh, and they will try, not always successfully. But they're in a position because they know the past statutes to some degree, present statutes. They have to have campaign uh, coherence, uh, and they'll try, even though we may think sometimes they fail. And there are always people who think, yeah, they failed here, they didn't fail there, to try to help, try to make a better. And K Senator Kennedy, whom I worked for, he said this a lot. He said, everyone in this building, the Senate, everyone in this building wants to help America. He said they have different ideas about how to do it. But you see their goal. And if they didn't somewhere have some goal like that, they wouldn't be here. All right. Now you think, well, they want to help America up in the Supreme Court, but they don't get around to the constituents, and they shouldn't. And, and uh, so uh, the chances of an interpretation that doesn't further what is very often a desirable purpose in this law. The chances of that have just gone up. And the chances of interpreting this document, this Constitution, in a way that helps do what Marshall wanted to do. He said, we can see the future only dimly, if at all. And we want a document here written in fairly abstract words, because you can't, as Montaigne said, you can't just write everything into a constitution. This is only 27 pages, I think, or something like that. But uh, risk here, risk that rather than when you just read the words at a time when, as I said, the women and the slaves were not part of the system, when you just read what that ordinary person would have thought of at that time, those words meant and how they should be applied, that you will eliminate something called the future. And so be careful and try to understand those basic principles, those basic values, and use them when they help, use them when they help. And so what is it that worries me so much? If we move in the wrong direction, of what Henry Hart said, my professor, and Albert Sachs, my professor, years and years ago, that the law is there. It's a human institution, this law. It's a human institution designed to make 320 million people now live, to live together. Every race, every religion, every point of view. That's what my mother said, don't tell anyone. We lived in San Francisco. She said, there's no, sign of, no point of view so crazy there isn't somebody who doesn't hold it in this country, and she said they all live in Los Angeles, but don't say she said <laughs> <laughs> But uh, 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 yeah.
Okay, you see, uh, we have to, says Henry Hart, says Sachs, and Sachs, these documents are designed to help us live together, even though we disagree. And to weaken that is a risk. To weaken that is a risk. To weaken the other is a risk. Because if it doesn't help us enough, people might say, hey, why follow it? Why follow the law? Why do what the law says when we disagree with it? And there, the rule of law itself is weakened. Now, do I think that'll happen? No. Maybe. Who knows? Now you see why I wrote the book. That was a very short question and a very long answer. It's an extremely serious answer, because you just said that textualism and originalism had two original justifications. First, that it was going to constrain judges, and second, that it would lead to deference to democratic outcomes. And it's done neither. In fact, it's done the opposite. And then when you come to the third reason, well, at least we're following the text, you say it's essentially random which decisions you're going to follow, because all of them are inconsistent with the text, and that would lead to overturning all of them. So given the power of that critique, I just have to ask, why shouldn't citizens conclude that it is all politics? Because that isn't politics. Politics, I mean, I learned, I learned politics. I'm in my office in the Senate working on the staff. I come back to my office, and there's a young woman who's looking through all my papers. And I say, excuse me, uh, can I help you? <laughs> and she says, yeah, I just wanted to find out. She says, what do people on the staff do here? So I thought the best way was to go into your office and look through all the papers. <laughs> so I think, hey, that's not a very good thing. But before I got angry at her, I thought the following. Maybe she's a constituent. Mm -hmm. Now that's politics, <laughs> you see. <laughs> and if the senator got a telephone call, two, one from the Secretary of Defense and one from the Mayor of Worcester. Which will he take first? Of course, the Mayor of Worcester. It's obvious to anyone in politics. That's where the constituents are. Uh-huh. And will I be able to get the Republicans and the Democrats to the executive session? And who's going to be popular? Which party? And what will I do to keep my seat? And uh, which constituents do I listen to and which do I not? And is a yes or a no here uh, going to help me uh, win the primary? Uh-huh. Oh, that's politics. Do I see that in the court? No. I don't, I don't see that. So that's why I hedge a lot. And I say, you might find people with different political philosophies, yes. And you might even find what I call real politics sneaking in occasionally. When Frankfurter said to the others during the terrible time they were having getting Brown enforced, uh, and they had a miscegenation case. And he said to the others, I read, uh, don't take it, because this is what the South is afraid of. And if we take it and hold it unconstitutional, which we must do, uh, God only knows what they'll do with Brown. No one's helping us, not the president, not the Congress. We've got to get that case enforced, Brown. And they did take the miscegenation case, but later, but later. And that's why I've always thought I'm very glad that Earl Warren had some experience with politics. You see, it was tough getting that Brown even partly enforced. And uh, so I'm not saying never. I'm not saying never. But I am saying you have things like your own background that sneaks in, and you have uh, political philosophy, and you have listening to others, and you have uh, sometimes the real politics. So I ended up, I, not a good quote, but I, I used to say, you ever read P.G. Woodhouse? I like P.G. Woodhouse, very funny. In one of his statements, he says, uh, Bertie woke up one morning and he wasn't uh, disgruntled, but he wasn't exactly gruntled either. <laughs> That's that sort of it. But I think Paul Florence is better. I think it's better. No judge takes into account the temperature of the day. But all judges do take into account the season, the climate of the season. And that's sort of where we are, which is uh, not a real answer, not a definite answer, but an experiential answer. Why, at the end of the 
book, I would say you're very, you're famously optimistic, and your optimism uplifts all of us. Uh, it certainly uplifts me in tough times. But I would call the end of the book uh, studiously uh, agnostic about whether optimism is merited. You say these are very serious times. You strongly oppose the textualist project, and you fear that it may be unstoppable, and yet you say in the end you think it, that they'll pull back. Why do you think they'll pull back? Well, you're on the court for a long time. Yeah. And uh, it takes time to adjust, as I say. And the longer I was told this by one of the presidents who said, you will discover something. The applause dies away very fast. You better like the job. And that's exactly what happens. And the job requires great seriousness of attention and effort. And that's true of everybody on the court. That's true of everyone. And so I think over time, over time, what's the job like in that sense? I'm at a three years and I'm some kind of meeting of young lawyers and one comes up to me and he says, oh, Justice Breyer, I love your opinions. They're so good and so well reasoned. Would you mind signing my program? So I say, sure, I'll sign. As he walks off, he turns to his friend and he says, that makes four. <laughs> okay, but that's what it is. And so the privilege of the job is having it and having to give your all to this case and then that case and is sort of like a doctor. The doctor doesn't say, oh, I'm not gonna treat this person because he has such a boring disease. No, no, that's not what it is. So I think over time, the flaws in this particular approach will become more apparent. You'll have a lot of cases and it won't give them the answer. And they'll see it right there. And they'll know it when they see it. Or they'll think, good, this gets rid of all these ap uh, appeals in this area which keep coming. And they'll discover it doesn't. And then they'll find that it doesn't give an answer that actually helps in terms of consequences for the people who have to live under that particular statute. And they'll discover that it isn't so impossible as they might think some of the time uh, to go back and see what the purposes were when Congress passed this statute or what was at hand when this Constitution was written and after the Civil War, when slavery ended and a few of the other amendments got passed like the right of women to vote and so forth. And they'll see that. They'll see it and the climate of the era just will hesitate to make them hesitate, hesitate to go too far with this textualism. You know, because you can use it in a way that doesn't hurt so much. You can say textualism means read the statute. Well, Okay, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, read the statute. Don't decide a case without reading the statute. I mean, I got that one. But so, so you don't know quite where it will go. And uh, so one of the reasons, as I said, I wrote this, I wanted to go as far away as possible. <laughs> and, and that's one of the reasons that I wrote the book. So that's one possibility. Uh, it, might this be another? Y you say it's not politics, but it is political philosophy. And the political philosophy is strongly anti-regulatory, and it's an effort to strike down the great society, if not the New Deal, and this is strongly held, and maybe they won't pull back because they really believe it, and therefore they will try to strike down the great society and the New Deal. Might that happen, and if it does, what would be the consequences? It, well, it could happen, and I wouldn't think they were good consequences, but remember when they uh, changed, the, the, the big uh, movement, towards agencies, towards big central government or bigger central government, and shifting power to Washington came during the New Deal. And the New Deal was itself a paradigm shift from a previous uh, uh, way of looking uh, at the court, uh, a way that made some sense at the time. That's what's sort of interesting. Alan Greenspan wrote a very interesting book to me about, a, about a, uh, the history of capitalism in the United States. And he says, and he's pretty well documented, that before the Civil War, this country was very poor, really poor. 
in the South, too. They couldn't afford to go to school. They couldn't afford a church. It was a very poor country. But after the Civil War, a boom. Inventions, electricity, power, railroads, and moreover, ways of financing those activities so across the country they could spread. And people became rich. And from one of the poorest countries in the world, it became one of the richest. So in my imagination, I'm thinking of that Lochner court, the court everyone despises. But they're sitting there at a time when they're thinking, the movement against property, the movement against contracts, the movement against uh, laissez-faire, that's going to kill the goose that's laying a golden egg. And so they turned against it. But by the time you get to the New Deal, the seasons change. You want to believe in laissez-faire and let all the businesses alone in a period of 24% unemployment, when people are on the bread line, when the Great Depression is right there? No. And uh, the, uh, who said this? Roosevelt said it, but I can't remember where I read it. He said, try something. If that doesn't work, try something else. And if that doesn't work, try something else again. But keep trying. Now, there's a season. There's a mood. And that's going on in the New Deal. And that's going on in a movement away when you go to the court that it changes attitudes. And so uh, even with what you say, maybe you go there and say the worst agency in the world ever was OSHA uh, because OSHA is supposed to uh, you know, save people from working and they have a rule which says paint the top three rungs of a ladder red so no one walks off the top. OK, they did have a rule like that. <laughs> so, so, so maybe they're not perfect. But by the time you try to get rid, I had a law clerk once who looked up every agency he could find where the people in uh, the uh, lower parts of the agency had tenure, and they were appointed by the people in the higher part that had tenure, and that was an issue in the case. And we found pages and pages worth. And all that's going to change? Really? All that's going to change? You see, I'm skeptical of how far they can go and how far they will go. And uh, I think the world, I think life will catch up. I think life will show them. And I think, by the way, that the changes in administrative law, and I'm so glad someone in this group took my administrative law class. <laughs> and, and, uh, but in administrative law, that, that isn't exactly textualism. The words there in the Constitution are legislative, executive, and judicial. And that doesn't tell you too much which way to go in these cases anyway. But they still might have the attitude you have, which is a different kind of a problem. Th those are such powerful points. You argue that the, the fight against the administrative state is not rooted in text. And you also show that previous transitions of the court from the Lochner era to the New Deal and the New Deal to the Warren Court were driven by changes in society. But this move is not. The textualist revolution, which was inaugurated in the 80s by President Reagan, doesn't arguably have the support of majorities of the country the way the previous shifts did. And that is, I guess, the argument that it's not going to be constrained by public opinion because it's set up in defiance to public opinion. Maybe. that's, that's uh, I'm not going to disagree with that. But, but it isn't that, well, President Reagan believes this, so we'll do that. That's just not the court. <laughs> I mean, uh, you're appointed. You're there. You better do what you think is the right thing, and uh, because there's nowhere else to go. And uh, th that's a more powerful uh, impulse than, well, you were appointed by those groups of people who thought there was too much power in Washington. And then you, you, you couple that, couple it with, all right, let's get rid of agency X, Y, or Z. And you begin to think of what might happen. Hmm. Hmm. You hesitate a little bit about going too far too fast. So there are a lot of things in human nature, and there are a lot of things in the judge, and there are a lot of things in the court itself that prevents it or hesitates or stops your going in some of these areas too far away from what will make the country, and this is why I use this word 50,000 times, what will help make the country work. 
that work, I think. They use it. I found a place where Marshall used it. <laughs> and uh, I like it because uh, making certain that the law is workable is certainly one of the ways you can describe the various things that I and others have traditionally looked at uh, in order to interpret difficult parts of the Constitution or the statutes. These are extraordinarily challenging times for democracy, as we know, in America and around the world, and polarization and social media have created the framers nightmare of uh, public discourse based on passion rather than cool reason. Why is it important that the court maintain its legitimacy during these extraordinarily serious threats to the rule of law? And will this court be moved by the remarkable times that we're in as it decides whether or not to proceed on this textualist path? As far as the ultimate answer to that question, I say the reader is going to have to read what I try to put down and take it as one person's point of view and see what they think the other is and make up his or her own mind. But what you're saying there is what you've written pretty well in your book, very well. Uh, you said, let's go back. Let's go back to see what the framers read. They read. <laughs> they read things I was supposed to read in Latin, but just bought the pony. <laughs> but the uh, uh, Seneca, Cicero, uh, some of the Greeks, the Stoics, they liked the Stoics. Marcus Aurelius. An Epictetus, which is the, uh, yes. the epigram for your yes, yes, book. Yes, for the book it is. Which I actually, I can't read without my constitutional reading glasses. It says don't tell people. It. it says don't do, tell people about what you think, do it. Do not explain your philosophy and body, it, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's true, so why did I write that? I don't know. But in, <laughs> in, 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 in any case, uh, you say they read these things. They read the French Enlightenment. They read David Hume, which we never read in philosophy, on moral on moral views, and the basic moral view of the Scottish Enlightenment, the French Enlightenment, and, and um, these other people, the Romans, the Greeks, is, uh, it was, uh, we're just filled with emotion. Ask Joanna, my wife, I am. <laughs> and and uh, uh, we're just, uh, remember the classical virtue, your stomach temperance, courage, yeah. wisdom, and justice, and uh, try to keep those passions under control. Try to keep them under control, and try to use your reason. And that's what Madison says. See, Madison says, we won't have that much of a problem. There will be factions. See, I learned this from you. There will be factions all over this country, but it's a big country, and the factions will all be different in different places, and time, it will take time to get these mob views across where they can have an impact and the government's complicated. Put those three things together and you will have time for people to reflect. And they in the government, like they individually, will be able to have reason in control. Mm -hmm. Well, today geography means nothing or not much. And time, zero. And complexity, yes, but it's more complex in different ways. And so can we find that substitute? Can we find that substitute for those things that Madison and the others, and they're all over here in that room, <laughs> Madison and the others thought would help bring the country under control. Jeff said the way to do it is get people to read and read deeply. I think that's true. I know what Kennedy used to say. Senator Kennedy, he would say that um, you're trying to work on a project, you have some opposition, find the person, and I think Mill said something like this, find a person who really disagrees with you and you think is intelligent and go talk to them. Wait, don't just talk to them, listen to them. Listen and listen, and eventually they'll come up with something that you really agree with. And when they do that, you say, what a good idea you have. Let's see if we can't work with that. And um, yeah, and they will. And sometimes you'll succeed. And if you succeed and get 30% of what you want, take it. Don't hold out for 100% so all your followers will say, oh, how great you are in getting, oh, no, you didn't get it. 
you see? Get the 30% and take it. And what I saw a lot, the press would go and say, uh, Senator Kennedy, you did such a good job on this bill. And he'd say, don't thank me, thank Orrin Hatch. He's the one that came up with the idea there. It allowed us to get together and produce something that will be helpful. Because he'd say to his staff, keep in mind this, credit is a weapon. It's a weapon. And uh, use it. If you're a success at what you're trying to do, or even a 30% success, there'll be plenty of credit to go around. And if it's a failure, who wants the credit? Yeah, good point. So there, and when I, I tell this to the fifth graders or the seventh graders or the high school students, and I'll tell you something, you can hear a pin drop. Silence. They're listening. They're listening. Because I say to them, when they ask me what I think they should do, I say, I'm very sorry. It's now up to you. It's not up to me. You're the ones who are going to have to figure out how to save this country, which has had its ups and downs like that. And where Churchill said the United States always does the right thing after trying everything else. <laughs> but um, yeah. OK, but we're not so bad at getting people together. In COVID, they came around and saw how the old people were doing. And did they have enough food? And neighborhood groups were created. And they were created in a lot of different cities and a lot of different places. We can work together. And we have a history of doing that, up and down, up and down. But what's interesting to me is the attention that those seventh graders or eighth graders or ninth graders were paying to this, because they want to do something. They want to help. And that's what I came away with. And it, it's that mood in that room of the high school students, the mood in the room of the high school students, that probably at the end where I say yes, no, <laughs> moves me in the direction of being optimistic. I have the same experience with this amazing job of convening high school students and students of all ages and listening to there are thoughtful civil debates. It really is the way things are supposed to be. But I want to go back to uh, this remarkable book. You talk about Madisonian deliberation as a judicial virtue and using powers of reason to tame passions. And you make a very strong case that Madison was a pragmatist and that he, after all, changed his opinion about the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States based on the fact that it had worked and people had come to accept it when you think about changing the minds, not only of your colleagues on the court, but of law students and kids in high school today that are trying to figure out how to apply textualism and originalism, might you appeal to Madison and say it was this pragmatic approach rather than Jefferson's strict constructionism, which wasn't even supposed to be applied by the Supreme Court, but by people in constitutional conventions, that actually represents the true original understanding of the way the courts were supposed to function? I can in the future. <laughs> I mean, you brought that up, and I think it's a good point. The way I put it in, in the past is I'll say to a graduating class, if I'm speaking to a graduating class, Colin, I'll say, uh, you know, I can't really tell you what to do. I can hope. I can hope that you'll find someone to love. I can hope that you'll have a job that you find rewarding. And I can hope that you will participate in public life, that you'll vote at least, that you may be library commissioner or a member of that board. You may work on the school board. There are a million ways you can do it. And the reason I can say with some authority on this last point is I have worked with this document here, and I believe strongly that if you don't, if you do not, and I think Adams and Madison might have thought this, uh, if you do not work in public life, if you don't do that, this won't work, because it foresees you're doing that. So I hope you do. I can tell them that, because I've told them that. That works. Yeah. That's uh, the one. We are. Um, and that's, a, I read this in Derek Bach's book, if you want a, a quotation on, on that particular point. Uh, he wrote a, a pretty good book about education. And he says, though I'm not sure it's true, he says that Pericles in Athens, when describing it, the famous funeral oration, uh, all the virtues of Athens, uh, he said, the democracy, whatever. He says, and what do we say in Athens of the man 
who does not participate in public life. Mm. We do not say, he is a man who minds his own business. We say, he is a man who has no business here. Pretty tough. Probably. Your remarkable and inspiring optimism in democracy rooted in an Athenian sense of the fact that our full potential is only achieved through political participation remains inspiring. Justice Breyer, I must thank you for embodying the Madisonian virtues that the framers hoped for when they thought about judges who would thoughtfully listen to all points of view with a sense of the limitations of the role of the court in our society and modeling the very civil dialogue on which the future of the republic depends. We're here in this sacred space at the National Constitution Center. I want you to just gaze over on Independence Hall, which we're about to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. I think we all could benefit from your optimism. Are you optimistic that the Declaration and the Constitution will thrive for the next 250 years, <laughs> and why should we be optimistic? Up to a point, Lord Gopper. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. It's an experiment. That's what Washington says. He says this is an experiment. He wrote that in a letter to a friend. Lincoln, Joanna, uh, got our uh, grandchildren. She said she'd give them $20 each if they memorized the Gettysburg Address. And what's that about? I, I first two lines of it. Our fathers, uh, 80, what, four score and seven years ago, our fathers came forth upon this continent uh, to create a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Today we are engaged in a great war to see whether that nation, I like these words, or any nation so conceived in liberty and so dedicated to that proposition can long endure. What's he saying? It's an experiment. You see, and it's my teaching that leads me to that. Why? Because I say to the teachers, that the teachers think they're like the uh, Lumiere, they're like the Enlightenment figures. They think we have a great theory, but it'll never work. <laughs> and then they think, let's see, the United States is going to try it. <laughs> let's see how long it takes them to fail. And there we are. Washington, an experiment. The people in the room, if they could only talk now, we're writing an experiment. Franklin, Constitution, if you can keep it. Lincoln, Lincoln, long endure. We can't promise it. We can just try. And it's that experiment and the reason that they should know it is why I think it cost you $60 or it cost you some amount of money <laughs> because they did memorize parts of that. And, and that's what we're living in. And in living in that experiment, we're no different than people who lived before us or people who lived after us. Friends, for his services to the Constitution and for inspiring all of us to keep the American experiment, please join me in thanking Justice Breyer.